Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Green. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Animal Law and Policy Program. Um, I'd like to just quickly thank our co-sponsors, the Harvard Animal Law Society, for helping with today's talk. And I'd also like to thank Restaurant Associates for helping provide all these wonderful plant-based Beyond Burgers for everyone. Um, Cass Sunstein is currently the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard. From 2009 to 2012, he was Administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. He also is the Founder and Director of the HLS Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy. Professor Sunstein is the author of numerous books and articles, uh, several of them related to animal law and policy. In 1999, he wrote on standing for animals. Uh, in 2002, he wrote The Rights of Animals, a very short primer. And in 2005, he co-edited the book Animal Rights, Current Debates, and New Directions with Martha Nussbaum. In his latest book, How Change Happens, How Change Happens, Professor Sunstein references issues of animal protection. And in a recent interview, noted that he has been much quieter about animal welfare and animal rights, but that he's going to start to get less quiet. Uh, we very much welcome that development here at the Animal Law and Policy Program and are very grateful to have Professor Sunstein join us today to talk about where do dogs come from. So please join me in welcoming Professor Cass Sunstein. So um, I'm so thrilled to be doing this. I begged to have the chance to present this to you all, um, inspired and amazed both by the turnout and the interest in these issues. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about an obsession of mine for the last few months, very unusual for a law professor, um, and the law and policy implications I'm going to be quiet about, uh, but I hope they will not be invisible. So uh, I'm asking where do dogs come from and where does Homo sapiens come from? Uh, those are my dogs, Finley and Snowy. And I have to say they are a motivation. An additional motivation is some remarks from a certain political leader who uses the word like a dog as a term of contempt and rage. Uh, Mitt Romney could have been president, but he choked like a dog. Uh, Senator Marco Rubio started to sweat like a dog. David Gregory was fired like a dog. Brent Bozell came begging for money like a dog. I have never seen a dog beg for money. Uh, former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, and former acting attorney general, Sally Rates, uh, Yates started to choke like dogs. OK, excuse me, what is, what is going on here? Uh, so the question is, what does it mean to be like a dog? Uh, what is it like to be like a dog? And you're going to hear the results of my quest. Uh, there's broad agreement that there are wolves and there are dogs. They split between 15,000 and 40,000 years ago. Dogs are 99.96% wolf genetically. Dogs came from wolves. That's generally believed to be true. It's good to ask what wolves. Probably there were ghost wolves, meaning goat wolves that are now extinct, that aren't around, from which both modern wolves and dogs descended. Uh, but what does it mean to say dogs came from wolves? A theory which had been prevalent for a long time uh, uh, is captured in the idea that human beings domesticated wolves. So the idea is theory number one, these creatures were tamed and handled by human beings. So the consensus is that 12,000 years ago, we liked them, we trained them, used them, befriended them, they helped us as well, and lo and behold, after generations, we had dogs. They were, on this count, floppier, friendlier, tamer, smaller, and a bit less smart. It's a kind of Pinocchio story of human beings making out of something like wood, not quite, flesh and blood, uh, a different kind of creature. Uh, it sounds reasonable, and everyone long thought it was right, but it has two big problems. First is, humans are really mean and fast and really strong. Uh, they kill. Human beings were pretty primitive back then. I don't like that person's chances a lot against that. Okay, 
so the story has a kind of uh, credibility issue, which current specialists think is uh, severe. The idea that human beings tamed and domesticated wolves seems uh, to run up against a, a physical fact. Here's another problem, a more subtle problem. Uh, people can do mirac a miraculous set of things. If I point there, you are by courtesy not looking there, and the reason is you know I'm doing an exercise. <laughs> but if someone points in a certain direction, uh, you will be able to read the mind of the pointer. That's part of how human beings' minds work. We have social intelligence, and for a long time it was thought that human beings were the only species that had social intelligence. Except recently discovered was the fact that dogs can do that too. That they can read people's intentions in exactly the same way. Wolves who are really smart can't do that at all. And chimpanzees who are really, really smart can't do that at all. So dogs are ahead of wolves on something exceptionally important. And that raises, I think, a deep question. What's going on here? OK, so theory two is that dogs domesticated themselves, and possibly they domesticated us as well. <laughs> and in any case, there's a big background mystery involving people. So part of the intrigue here is there have been several different species of human beings, Neanderthal man, Homo erectus, and um, uh, uh, four or five others. Uh, Homo sapiens, sapiens, and everyone in this room is mostly that. <laughs> we survived. We domesticated ourselves. So to get a little bit of ahead of the story, as wolves are to dogs, so is Homo sapiens to the now extinct species. That the parallel is extremely precise. But as bonobos are said to be the dog of the apes, Homo sapiens is the dog of the Homo species. OK, does that sound crazy? So what we're going to do is go to Russia in the 1950s, actually to Siberia, where it's really cold. And there is a brave, threatened scientist named Dmitry Belyaev, who may be the greatest scientist who's widely unknown. Certainly the most wildly charismatic. His brother was killed during the terror of Lysenko and Stalin for doing Western genetics. He was a follower of Darwin, though, who insisted on pursuing the questions we're now exploring in a way that was scientifically rigorous. That's him. He was uh, in a room, uh, the person who took over the room, by virtue of his intensity and charisma and magnetic eyes, even though he was small, he was um, the most impressive person people had ever met. That's the guy. You can also see from the picture a kind of gentleness in his hands. So notwithstanding his fierceness, he was in one respect himself like a dog. He was a war hero in World War II fighting against Hitler, which gave him a degree of immunity from Stalin. He had a bold speculation about the origins of dogs. He also had a thought, which he ventured lightly, about the origins of Homo sapiens. His job was to raise foxes for their fur, and he was really good at that. So in a tough Soviet economy, he could make a lot of money by raising precious, expensive fur and getting the world to buy it. He was really uh, the champ at that. He said to the authorities he wanted to study foxes to produce more and better fur. That was his articulated theory. But he wasn't so much interested in that. What he was doing was taking a risk with his work and his life, trying to explore how become wolves became dogs. And he thought that floppy ears, bigger snouts, more periods of fertility, smaller brains, not less intelligence, but all of these characteristics of the dogs were features of just one thing, byproducts of just one thing. And that was tameness. Some call it friendliness. 
This is a very bold thesis because the idea is that everything in the species of dogs comes from just one thing, a decrease in flight or fight syndrome, a willingness to approach, less flight, and a willingness not to attack, less bite. He worked with Ludwika Trutt, his young protege, who was in the early days his uh, second in command, and she is still there in her 80s running the Institute of Cytology and Genetics, where she continues the experiments you're about to hear about. So he had an idea that foxes could be the foundation for testing the theory of tameness and friendliness as the source of everything. The problem is that silver foxes aren't very nice. That's not the most gruesome picture of an aggressive silver fox you could see. But still, that's not a creature who you'd want to adopt and have in your home. It's not really nice. He noticed foxes are often angry and scared. They bite. 90% were like that, basically like the one in this picture you saw. And he asked, what if we bred the tame ones to each other? What if we tried to speed up evolution by taking the 10% tamest and having them bred to each other? Now, he told his associates, there's a good chance this isn't going to work. It might be a failed experiment. But if it does work, we're going to learn something important. And we're probably going to learn a lot of things that we don't know we're going to learn. We can't anticipate what we're going to learn. So he tested how aggressive they were and how frightened they were, and took the top 10% in the initial pool, had them breed with each other, and then had those breed with each other, and so on. And because you get a litter of foxes every year, you can get four generations in, if I've done the math correctly, Four years. <laughs> At the same time, he had control foxes, regular ones, mean ones, that are there to this day. It's a nice question, how well are they taken care of? Uh, not horribly. They're there. They are given uh, somewhere between decent and good lives. But they're scary, and they're not friendly. OK, so the idea was to speed up historical time. Now, that's a picture from the very first litter. And you can see something noticeable. There's a hand there on the fox. And there's no biting. And there's no running. A little tamer. By the sixth, they were a lot tamer. One started to wag his tail. This is the first fox in the history of the planet, so far as we know, that started to wag its tail at the approach of a human being. And the experimenters in seeing this were flabbergasted. The joy and delight of the little fox seeing the wagging. And of the children of that male fox, several of them wag theirs too. After eight plus generations, just after eight years, there started to be categorization of the foxes into class one, who were most like the standard fox, up to elite foxes, or class four. And after a few generations, the elite foxes, who were gentle and kind, uh, started to be plentiful to the point where right now, as of today, 80% of the <coughs> foxes, through the Russian domestication experiment, 80% of them are uh, elite. OK, a lot of things started to happen. The little foxes started to lick people's faces. They would play with people. They would whine when people left. People would say, sit, and the fox would sit. People would say, good fox. <laughs> they would live with people. Then they started to develop different colors. White patches. That was not anticipated, a byproduct of domestication. Their faces started to recede, meaning they protruded less. As dogs are to wolves, the silver foxes that had been domesticated were to the silver foxes. And the female foxes had more menstrual cycles. So along six or seven dimensions, they started to be less like foxes and more like dogs. 
This is a recent American investor, visitor. They leapt into my arms, muscle against my face, and licked my cheeks with their little pink tongues. This is a staggered American visitor. <laughs> Asking, is this the environment, you might think? Is there some signals being given? <clears throat> well, if you take the domesticated foxes and you raise them with the aggressive foxes, they're going to be tame. If you take the wild fox pups and raise them in a domestic family, they're not going to be tame. They're still wild. If you implant the <coughs> wild foxes in the mothers that are tame, they end up wild. If you implant the tame foxes in the, through in vitro in the mothers who are uh, tame, the wild ones end up wild no matter who they're implanted in, and the tame ones too, which suggests this is genetic rather than social. Here's a picture of ease and warmth. There's a picture, relatively recent, uh, long after belly I have. And there are the colors. The foxes are starting to look like dogs. When raised as pets, companion animals, we should say, they're devoted, affectionate, and they form strong bonds. They seek out human contact. The breed behavior is friendly even before they are a month old. On leashes, they behave. On rocks, without a leash, they come back. They're not quite like dogs, but they're pretty close. Bally and I have died in 1985. He planned a book, which he never wrote, called Man Makes a New Friend. Okay. I hope the ethical, political, and legal implications are implicit in this about the um, separation between wild and domesticated animals and its relative thinness and also the um, uh, ethical obligations that human beings might have to the domesticated creatures, um, not more than to the wild, but in virtue of various things that we're going to discuss. Remember what dogs can do? They can read hand signals. A scientist who's now at Duke named Brian Hare discovered that this was certain a change in cognition could not possibly happen by accident. The smarter facts, foxes would have to breed with the smarter foxes. So this wouldn't be observed in the Russian experiment. His advisor, the great Richard Wrangham, who's at Harvard, said, I think you're wrong. I think the domesticated foxes might accidentally develop this skill. Which was an extremely bold prediction. And his graduate student had the safer prediction. So the graduate student went to Siberia to find out. He braved the cold, and he found that the control foxes were just like wolves and chimpanzees. They could not read gestures. The domestic foxes were, domesticated foxes were really good at it. They were about as good as dogs. And he reported, the foxes totally rocked my world. <laughs> what he's learning is that trust and um, cooperation, which human beings are really good at, two other creatures are good at, dogs and domesticated foxes. OK, here's the theory about what probably happened <coughs> roughly. About 12,000 years ago, some wolves were tamer and friendlier than other wolves. <coughs> they came to human villages. They visited. They found food and possibly <coughs> shelter. They liked people. They were like Belyaev's foxes. People liked them. It didn't happen instantly. It might have taken a long time. But eventually, those particular dogs bred with each other. And they became the uh, equivalent of the dogs we now know and love. OK. As this happened, they started to wag. They stopped looking like wolves, <coughs> floppy ears, curly tails, splotchy coats, which suggests dogs domesticated themselves. We didn't domesticate them. OK, you might be skeptical, and we haven't nailed the argument yet. We've just given some suggested evidence. 
New Guinea singing dogs and dingoes are probably the closest dogs to the original dog, the Ur dog. They haven't been bred by people, not intentionally. The New Guinea singing dog, which is fun to look at if you look it up on YouTube, it is sometimes described as a half wild proto dog. Can they read human gestures? Absolutely. They ace the test every time. Chills down your spine? Dingoes also. They ace the test every time. These are not intentionally bred by human beings. Okay, so the idea here is the experiment with dog fox domestication just demonstrated that under conditions of strong uh, pressure on the behavioral genetic system, there occurred an increase in eight to 10 generations in morphology and physiology. So the dog did not remain unaltered for a long time. Okay, now let's sneak up a little bit on um, like a dog and its meanings. In chimpanzees, males call the shots and there's a fair bit of beating and killing. Chimpanzee world is, is pretty tough. Bonobos are different. The females call the shots and there's a lot of lovemaking. There's much less from bonobos in the way of reactive aggression. Meaning if you cat a wolf, there's a significant chance if you don't do it right, it's going to go for your hand. If you pat a chimpanzee, that's also a risk. If you pat my Labrador Retrievers or a bonobo, nothing like that is likely to happen. Bonobos, the going theory from Richard Wrangham is they domesticated themselves too. It's just like what happened with dogs. And guess what? Reading social signals, understanding intentions through pointings, smart chimpanzees have no clue. Bonobos completely get it. They're like dogs. OK, so here the speculation is that uh, Neanderthal man, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo naledi, why did we emerge victorious? OK. Um, the idea here is that it's uh, plausible to think that the tamer among us of the homo species found better ways to survive, better ways to tolerate, and better <coughs> ways to cooperate. Less in the way of reactive aggression. More in the way of proactive aggression. <coughs> when human beings can plot and plan what to do, but if you touch us or offend us, the likelihood that we will strike out is much lower than with our predecessors who are now extinct. Dogs have much less reactive aggression than wolves, and domesticated foxes have much less than wild foxes. This has been described as survival of the friendliness, friendliest. <laughs> Now, why this is inspiring, I hope, is not obscure in a very difficult world and political environment. That what made Homo sapiens uniquely capable of defeating obstacles and of surviving where Neanderthal, man, etc., couldn't, it looks like Neanderthal basically as smart as human beings, is that we were able to trust each other and to be kind to each other, like a dog. Okay, here are the four markers of domesticated animals. Smaller bodies, shorter faces that don't project as far, far, far forward. The differences between males and females are less highly developed. And there's something really interesting here and um, uh, subversive, I think, which is that among domesticated creatures, including emphatically Homo sapiens, Men are feminized, and thank goodness for that. That's one of the things that made us able to survive. And we have smaller brain cavities and thus brains. Not less intelligence, just smaller brain cavities and brains. And all four of those mark the differences between wolves and dogs and the difference between chimpanzees and bonobos. OK, here's Harvard's own Richard Wrangham. Human beings are best understood as an animal species that has been domesticated, like dogs, horses, or chickens. 
Recent archaeological evidence suggests that human beings became increasingly docile and less reactively aggressive around the time of becoming Homo sapiens, a process that started about 300,000 years ago. This is the best modern solution we have to the greatest mystery story, I think, that human beings have ever tried to unravel, which is our origins. And the idea is that in the Fox experiments, we can see the origins of the kindest and gentlest of the creatures and the clue to our own longevity against, uh, against pretty stacked odds. OK, so dogs acted as humans' alarm system, trackers and hunting guards, garbage disposal facilities, yes, hot water bottles, and children's guardians and playmates. Human beings who were tolerant of proto-dogs would have been better off than those who were not. Now, there's something dramatic in that suggestion, which is that one of the clues to the survival of Homo sapiens may be not just our comparative domestication, but the human-dog bond, where we could enlist dogs and dogs would enlist us together which made us able, as our competitors weren't, uh, uh, to act for mutual benefit. Over the last 150 years, something <coughs> happened. This, that's all very recent, all coming from the proto-dogs. Maybe 200. There are two groups now, wolf-like, and both others called the European dogs, among the European dogs, the differences are very small in domestic in genetic terms. Just a few genes made the difference. And so as different as a Chihuahua and as a Great Dane look, they're really, really close. And they're all descendants of the original dog. OK, I'm done. This is a story which has two heroes. There's the first, a war hero. Uh, even braver, probably, in his research than he was in combat. He put his life on the line. He died relatively young. You can see in that picture even more than other with his own foxes, uh, his gentleness and um, kindness. And now we know what it means to be like a dog. Thanks. Okay, we're recording today's event, so please put your hand up and wait for me to get to you for a question. So, is there a question right here? Hi, I, <coughs> thanks for doing this. This was really, really interesting. Um, the, the one question I had is, what's the connection between the behavior selection and the physical manifestations of it? Because it seems like there could be a situation where the behavior changes over time, but they look the, the exact same. It's a great question, and I don't have a great answer. But apparently, the genetic changes that are induced as tameness is fostered also have as a byproduct these other physiological changes. So it's like we have, by virtue of a number of things, byproduct characteristics, which may or may not be useful, but it's not like nature selected for them in particular. And so the genetic alteration that gets creatures not to run from each other also produces color change. And what Baliaev thought, this was a kind of very early and not uh, widespread uh, innovation on Darwin, is that a lot of characteristics of living creatures aren't a product of evolutionary pressure. They're a byproduct of something which is a product of evolutionary pressure. And he even said, I bet we're going to get some different colors. So he, he foresaw that. Any other questions? I hope you're thinking about ethical and political and legal implications. So, you, so I have two kind of interests here. One is just understanding all this. And second, seeing what its normative implications, if any, are. We want to be careful, I think, 
because the valorization of the domesticated animal isn't earned by the story. And uh, I think it would be very hard to find a way to earn it, meaning to say that because dogs are, have these characteristics, they deserve something that wolves don't do. Meaning it doesn't follow that wolves should be shot by virtue of the fact that they're uh, more likely to bite. It does follow that you'd be probably uh, unduly brave to adopt one. <laughs> um, but there's something in, in the account that uh, shows, the, shows, I think, very vividly the um, difficulty of defending a separation between human beings and non-human animals. Puts it in very vivid form, doesn't it? And also the idea of certain kinds of instrumental use of non-human animals seems extremely puzzling in view of this story. Human beings who are the dog of, are of, of a homo genus, the idea that we would, by virtue of what we've got, be entitled normatively to this various stuff. Where would that come from? Thank you very much. Um, I don't know where I heard the theory, but I recently heard that within the last couple of months that um, dogs were originally domesticated in China. And just like you had bred the foxes, the, it was a relatively quick process. Uh, it wasn't a final process, but they had taken them and they had actually bred them like that. Um, and I was wondering, because dogs are meat eat these things are meat eaters, why people didn't use um, vegetarians as pets, you know, okay. that would have been less aggressive, okay. possibly. There, there's a lot there. So uh, my understanding is the current view is that dogs didn't become dogs in just one place. It was more than one place. Okay. Um, and it, it seems to have happened, given the archaeological record, you know, in the scheme of human history, relatively simultaneously in various places a long time ago, give or take a few thousand years, that uh, it happened. Uh, if, if the account which I'm discussing what is the prevailing view is right, the reason human beings didn't take vegetarian creatures like giraffes is that human beings didn't take anything. Human beings didn't domesticate dogs. In villages of various sorts, creatures came. And they were, roughly speaking, wolves. And they were gentler than the average wolf. And they would take scraps. And they would interact. And they would protect. And they would maybe play. And as the years went on, the human <coughs> being's attraction to the creatures who were around grew. They became friends. And uh, nothing like that happened with giraffes or <laughs> vegetarians. So this puts uh, canine agency at the forefront of the story. And it's, it has a surface plausibility. There's a guy named Raymond Coppinger who uh, developed relatively recently, basically 18 or 19 years ago, the the theory of dog self-domestication. And there are parts of the story that currently are not thought to be clarified sufficiently by him, though his basic story is widely thought to be better than anything else, is that the, uh, that the Pinocchio version story, as he calls it, it's crazy. The idea that there'd be wolf puppies and people would domesticate them 20,000 years ago What's the, how would that happen even? And given, I mean, Coppinger's own uh, weaving of the tale started in his own mind when he went to visit wolves and the wolf trainer said, you know, treat them like dogs. They're basically like dogs. And he gave one pat, good pat on the back. And he came very close to having his hand bitten off 
It was a terrifying scene. And the trainer said, what are you doing? Run! <laughs> and he did run. And uh, uh, there's something. Now, the reactive aggression idea is startlingly <coughs> recent. It's Richard Rangham. And the kind of the... You can tell I'm at very early stages, though I have a book review, uh, is that uh, uh, each of us has a capacity for reactive aggression. And probably you know where you are on a scale of reactive aggression. You can probably come up introspectively from 0 to 10. Yes, each of us. And, and it's a very dangerous thing. And it's dangerous in political domains as well as you know, on the street, reactive aggression. And the account of human beings' relative diminution of reactive aggression as enabling us to cooperate, as Neanderthals did, couldn't quite so much, and to hear one another, because you weren't scared. And that could <coughs> enable, random speculation is culture is essential to Homo sapiens' uh, success. And how do you have culture? You have to be able to memorize things that go, remember things that go through generations. So you have to be attentive to other minds. And that that is, you know, uh, an essential thing. So to, to name reactive aggression, as Rangham did for the first time in 2017, and linked it to bonobos versus chimpanzees, dogs versus wolves, human beings versus our predecessors, that, uh, you know, there's something in that. Uh, speak, speaking of culture, I'll, as I get over the next question, have you have you looked larger at how societies have, have viewed dogs? I know that um, early Mesopotamian society, for example, some of the early, as we formed, humans formed mystical belief systems, some of the early gods took the forms of dogs, and, uh, and they recognized the role of dogs in the transmission of rabies, and we had this one bite rule, which still stands today, where you were sort of given one free bite before a dog was destroyed. And that, to me, shows just the high value dogs had in that society. They knew that this had the potential to kill humans, and yet you still got one free bite. That That's I do. Really, really extremely interesting. Um, hi, I had a question about, do you think we had to already be underway in our own domestication process to be amenable to these tamer wolves? And if so, do you think like the time at which, the fact that humans kind of started to domesticate, or dogs started to domesticate themselves with humans at a certain point, might give some clues as to the timeline of our own self-domestication? It's a great question. And the answer is probably right. That if we were you know, not domesticated at all, our reaction to living and potentially violent creatures near us would not be positive. So we needed a certain receptivity an ability to do something other than fight or flee, clearly right. And that's consistent with Rangham's account, which is that uh, human beings were able to interact with one another once they were on the road to domestication. And that would enable human beings, as our predecessors couldn't, to interact with non-human animals on a conditions of mutual, what is it, cooperation. Right. So I can't help thinking of a lot of recent moral psychological work on tribalism, the idea that a fundamental feature of how we think morally is not just that we have this kind of unconditional love for all humans, but that we're selective in the love we give. And I'm also reminded of the ways that wolves are supposedly travel in packs, and in which we sort of we speak metaphorically of dogs bonding with human families as being part of the pack. So I wonder how you think of the relationship between this absolute decrease in reactive aggression on the one hand and what seems to be the fact of tribal behavior or tribal categories, at least in humans and probably to some extent in dogs on the other, whether that complicates this picture or how that more selective moral system of thinking relates to just becoming friendlier and tamer across the board. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, so the easy way to handle it, easy and adequate way, is to say that we are proactively aggressive. So if our tribe is under risk from another tribe, we're able to plot and plan and figure things out as no other creature on the planet can. 
And to call it proactive aggression is right because it can result in a war. We can, we can wage a war. And so we could say that tribalism is uh, made possible and fueled by proactive aggression, not reactive aggression. But I think that's inadequate because reactive aggression against tribes is, is a real thing. So the maybe gap in Wrangham's own account is the uh, specification of how reactive aggression in human beings and dogs is not gone. It's just diminished. And what are the conditions for, for its display? And then to figure out why tribal conflict would fuel, I think, psychologically, reactive aggression. That's pretty interesting, and it varies across tribes and individuals. I'm thinking politically now, where um, the degree of almost violent outrage that can be fueled by a misdeed across tribal categories is you know, astonishing. How can it be that a member of the human species says something that looks like it's X or Y or Z, and then something in people's mind turns violent? Hi, Professor. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. Um, I'm just curious about whether you've looked into how cats would fit into this theory. Because, um, they, I, from what I understand, they just don't have the same social intel intelligence that dogs do. Um, uh, I have looked a little into this, and we don't, we don't have similar findings with respect to cats. <laughs> but, but whether that's because people haven't looked carefully or not, or not this is a great question. So, uh, to, as, as far as I'm aware, there's no evidence that cats can follow social signals in the way dogs and bonobos can. What I'd love to know is whether cats have the same relationship to, let's say, wild cats as dogs do to wolves? And the answer is probably some, yes, basically. That flight or fright is diminished, uh, smaller, um, less protuberant face. Um, all of the markers are there. Um, whether you could do something, whether we've done with respects to cats, something like the Russian fox experiment, it's a nice question probably along three or four dimensions we have. Any other questions? I mean, first of all, I have to thank you again for coming yeah. to speak on this. I think someone of your prominence in academia talking about animals in such a serious way goes a long way for society taking animals more seriously, so thank you. Um, one question that came to mind is when it comes to animals that are deemed to be more reactively aggressive, it seems like a lot of these tests seem to discuss we're in captive settings. I'm wondering what um, what factor do you think that plays? The fact that these are captive settings and maybe these animals might not actually be more reactively aggressive are the policy implications there as well? Okay, great. So undoubtedly in a captive situation, you could have justified or whether or not justified natural fear that you're under threat. So whether a wolf or a, you know, a big cat under captive situation is more likely to strike out than a natural setting. It's a very reasonable question. Might be everything's heightened there. Uh, if, if Wrangham is correct, that in the wild, you, unless you are a wolf, and possibly even if you are a wolf, you want to be careful with wolves. So even in the wild, uh, there, there's a, a threat. Uh, on your initial remarks, given for which I'm grateful, let me say something about uh, animal welfare and law, because I know a lot of you were interested in that. And just my personal experience, which was um, surprising to me. So as noted, I worked on animal welfare and animal rights a bit. Um, co edited a book, wrote a few articles on it. And uh, I, when I was up for confirmation by the US Senate for my regulatory job, I was stunned to see the reaction. Uh, the most surprising, speaking of reactive aggression, was <laughs> a, a, a credible death threat at my unlisted home address. How'd they find out where I lived? It was a credible death threat. Um, the more proactive aggression was the Animal Farm Bureau writing a letter to every member of Congress saying he can't be confirmed, he's going to make everyone poor and sad. <laughs> <laughs> and it was 
you know, to see both behind closed doors the decency of, of not the guy who had the death threat, but in the American Farm Bureau, completely decent people, and the uh, nuclear artillery in these areas, that was interesting. And things do seem to be changing in a hurry. It, it feels a little on some of the animal welfare issues like uh, same-sex marriage and gay rights in the 1990s, that we may be on the cusp of something. And the fact is that people's um, commitment to certain practices, I'm not sure if meeting is an example, but it might be, is much weaker than the practice itself suggests. Meaning, if you have delicious meals like the meal we had today, people would be just as happy with that. And so it may be that the, the, there's a, a, an opportunity here in a way that's you know, maximally respectful of the American Farm Bureau. They're trying to protect the uh, well-being of a lot of fellow Americans. And what's going to happen to them if you know, they can't earn money? That's a completely good question to ask. Hi, Professor. So, um, from the experience, I'm wondering, does that mean we had some foxes that could not be domesticated, right? That, but there were still foxes, and the foxes that were domesticated, they were also foxes. So when we now turn to the human beings, does that mean that we have, um, not talking about the other uh, species that didn't live up, uh, the non homo okay. sapiens, within us, does that mean some of us are hopeless, that there's nothing we can do because it's their gene, whereas the others can be domesticated? I mean, this is, I mean, I'm thinking about criminal The answer law, would be yeah. yes. Uh, note that domestication occurs at the species level, not at the level of individual animals. So the, uh, the fact that the, you know, certain kinds of foxes were not put in the uh, treatment group because they were biting and such. I th think to say they couldn't be domesticated is correct. But, but it's not what Belyaev is thinking about domestication. He's thinking about, can the species be domesticated? And the way to do that, he thinks, how it happens is the tamest or the friendliest are separated either through geography or something. And they start to breed with each other. And there, then theirs are. So the fact that the foxes couldn't be domesticated is true that you couldn't turn the, the wild foxes into friendly uh, companion animals. But that's not what he's focused on. It is true, evidently, that, certain, that a number of animals just can't be domesticated in Balyaev's way. Now, because of how nature works and because of what human beings have done so far, we don't know what belongs in that category. So would it be possible to domesticate tigers if you took the tamest 5% of tigers and bred them with each other? Is that how cats came about? Maybe, so maybe the answer is yes. Would it be possible to domesticate coyotes? Maybe. So if it's not possible, it would be very interesting to know why. Um, and uh, uh, I think Belyaev would say any claim about the impossibility of domestication would be, should be taken with grains of salt. It may be just the effort hasn't been, the right effort hasn't been made. Yeah. Hi, um, I don't know much animal law, nor am I a law student, but uh, uh, to what extent do domesticated animal breeds have uh, distinguished status in American law, and how have legislators justified that in the past? It's a, it's a great question. So there are anti-cruelty laws which emphatically apply to domesticated creatures. They vary from state to state, but the anti-cruelty laws in some states include not merely a right not to be treated you know, physical violence, but also a treat to a right to care and comfort, so food and water and such. Uh, how that is justified compared to the mistreatment of zillions of other animals is an extremely nice question. 
So we were talking before I started about uh, the fact that in China, with the one-child policy, a number of children in China have been raised with a dog, who was the equivalent of their sibling in terms of their growing up. And that is um, uh, um, connected with keen interest in protecting other non-human animals on the theory that sympathetic uh, identification or something is bred, so to speak, in people who grew up that way. And so the, the distinction between people who would you know, not bear the thought of eating their own dog, that would be you know, one of the worst imaginable things, and people's comfort with mistreatment of dog of, of non-human animals raised for food that aren't dog dogs that's that's hard. I mean, it's normally hard to figure out how that squares. And so, uh, it's you know, it, it may be connected with tribalism. The dogs are, are are ours. They're our friends, and other kinds of animals are things. Okay, got time for one more question here. I'm all joining over here. Thank you. Um, just going back to the, uh, the earliest dogs, when or how was, were their um, carnivorous instincts tamped down so that they could be trusted to be with the uh, animals in the village, the chickens and the pigs, and begin herding those or protecting those animals without going after them? Which I know sometimes still happens. Okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you the direction of an answer, which is that uh, dogs are carnivorous in the sense that they'll eat meat, but whether they will chase a chicken or a squirrel uh, or other living creatures is a function of how friendly they are. And so a friendly animal, a dog, will hesitate before attacking at least compared to a wolf. And so the, the, I would predict that Baliaev's foxes would be less likely to strike out at other animals in the vicinity than regular foxes. Now what's going on in the head such that it's like that is, is extremely interesting to think. And uh, okay, so at Harvard, basically five minutes from here, there are uh, brains of Baliaev's actual foxes, not from 1985, but ones who lived a long life, and then after they died, they came here. And so neuroscientists here are studying to see what, what's happening neurologically. And there are things that wouldn't be amazing if we found that the amygdala is associated with fear and anger, and whether the amygdala of a dog looks like the amygdala of a wolf, probably not, not quite the same, or it's uh, interaction with the prefrontal cortex, not the same. Rangham, who was uh, you know, the state-of-the-art guy, is not a neuroscientist, but here's something that might be true. That is that human beings have a very well-developed prefrontal cortex, which would tamp down on reactive aggression and promote proactive aggression. So we can plot and plan how to get back at our enemies. Uh, President Kennedy said, don't get mad, get even. And that could easily have been the, I don't love that phrase, I should say, because, you know, get even is too vengeful. So don't get mad, do something good. <laughs> <laughs> and don't get mad, don't even could easily have been the epigraph for his book. Uh, and there could be neural correlates of that. The prefrontal cortex would say, you know, calm down. And then the prefrontal cortex would help you figure out how, what to do. Oh, All right. right. Well, great. Did you have, did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. My mind has kind of been answered already, but I was just wondering: um, is there something wrong with domestication, like morally? Well, if it happens, that's a, also a great question. I think if okay, so. I, I follow Bentham on these issues, meaning the question is not can they think, the question is uh, do they suffer? So the question, in my view, would be what kind of lives are they capable of living? And so if 
I, I, I don't think, unless there's something going on in Belly Eye of Experiment that involved uh, you know, independently wrong things, the fact that he bred the tamus with the tamus and the tamus of those with the tamus, and they ultimately ended up super friendly. I wouldn't say there's a moral problem with that, but I can see the direction from which one would go. One would be in order to do that, you had to do things to them that were in the general vicinity of cruelty. I hope that wasn't true. But, and, and, and that would be convincing if true as a matter of fact. Another possibility would be to say that uh, tampering with nature in this way, creating these you know, extremely artificial creatures as they were, is itself morally problematic. <coughs> I would be hesitant to embrace the second view on the ground that with John Stuart Mill, in my view, the nature, you know, in nature, we don't have eyeglasses and if we don't have shoes. And so that naturalness on this, on Mill's view, has no moral claim. Well being has a moral claim, but not, not nature. I'll say something a little controversial right now, I think, if, if I may. Um, the animal welfare laws seem to me to have extremely strong moral foundations. You know, and the fact that our animal welfare law at the federal level means much less than it should is not ideal. Let's phrase it like that. Uh, the endangered species law, which many people are super enthusiastic about, whom the Animal Welfare Act leaves cold, I'm for the Endangered Species Act. But killing the last one of a species, why that's a moral atrocity compared to killing, let's say, 100,000 of a species that isn't endangered. It's not clear what, whether that's defensible, unless, unless killing the last one creates some ecological problem. Now, to think that human beings suffer a terrible loss when there aren't any more exes, not like ex-spouses. <laughs> X meaning specifying that species. That's true. And it may serve an ecological foundation. But uh, I think it's in the same family, the, the Endangered Species Act, as the, uh, you know, as royalty of our animal protection laws. In my view, it should be the Animal Welfare Act that's royalty. And that's, I think, analogous to thinking that if Belly had mistreated those foxes, that's morally really problematic. If he treated them well, and they were bred and turned out to be man makes a new friend, then it would be OK. All right, well, please join me again.